Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Senior Safety Officer webinar. We are just allowing everybody to roll in, so we're just going to give it another minute or so. This webinar is being recorded, and you will be able to view the webinar on our website uh, in a week or so. So we're just going to wait another minute and let the rest of the people who have registered for the webinar just come on in. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Alzheimer's Society of York Region webinar. My name is Jamie Cruz, and I am the public education coordinator for the Alzheimer's Society of York Region. It is absolutely my privilege and my honor to be able to present this wonderful webinar to you from our York Region Police Senior Safety Team. So we have today our social worker with the York Region Police, Chantelle Bennett, and we have Officer Aaron Brown. And our two YRP staff are going to be sharing fantastic information today that is going to teach us about how to keep our seniors safe as well as ourselves safe. So our first presenter today, I would like to introduce Chantelle Bennett. Chantelle Bennett is a registered social worker with the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers. As a member of the Ontario Association of Social Workers, she has experience working with a diverse group of individuals that include older adults, caregivers, survivors of domestic abuse, and elder abuse. In 2016, Chantel became the social worker for the, sorry, for the personal safety team and began managing the Project Lifesaver and Vulnerable Persons Registry Program at York Region Police. She works collaboratively with clients to increase their quality of life. Chantel is passionate about helping others and aims to help others develop healthy coping strategies to utilize their daily lives. Thank you so much, Chantel, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanna say a special thank you for Jamie for inviting us here to present to everyone today. Jamie, we appreciate you so much for organizing this event and giving us an opportunity to share who we are and what we do with everyone. So for those of you who are not familiar with me, hello again, my name is Chantel. And like Jamie said, I am a social worker with York Regional Police. My teammate, Aaron Brown, um, we'll say hi everyone <laughs> to Aaron, And she will be presenting, there she is. <laughs> So Erin will be uh, sharing some great things to consider um, after my after the presentation of how to keep our older adults safe in our community. We really want this presentation to be very interactive. 
So if you have questions, feel free to ask. We want this to be a safe place to ask questions and there's no question too silly if it's for the intention of learning more information for your clients. So Arrow will be reviewing the chat box when I'm talking and uh, we also have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Um, also, as a note, I won't be able to see if there's any hands raised, so if you do have any pressing questions, you can also feel free to unmute yourself or just use the, the chat box. Okay. So now that the housekeeping items are done, uh, not many people are familiar that we have social workers a part of York Regional Police. We, in fact, have two. So there's uh, myself and my colleague, Sarah Amen. So Sarah is the social worker program lead for our mental health related incidences, which includes calls related to individuals under the age of 60, including children. She also works very closely with our mental health support team. We'll be talking about a little bit more in depth uh, momentarily. And then as for myself, I am the personal safety social worker lead, and um, which includes incidences involving vulnerable persons, and I manage the Project Lifesaver and the Vulnerable Person Registry programs. I also work very closely with our senior safety officers, who you'll hear a little bit more about momentarily. Um, together, Sarah and I will review recent police occurrences that involve mental health and or vulnerable persons in order to address and assess whether additional supports might be needed for the client or for the family um, themselves. We also accept direct referrals from officers, and the main goal of our team is to help to reduce the amount of non-police related incidents and calls, um, uh, reduce the amount of inappropriate calls made to 911 by just providing some more education about common callers um, and letting them know about what referrals and what services are out there in the community. It is very common for individuals to contact police when there is an emergency. And in some situations, although the incident is not necessarily a police-related incident, it is a very um, emergent situation for them. Um, however, sometimes 911 does become a bit of a default. For instance, you might have someone who, a parent who might call police because their child isn't listening, um, an older adult calling police because their, the home care worker didn't come to the home on time, or one of my personal favorites, uh, someone who calls 911 because they want the non-emergency police number. So part of what Sarah and I will do is to provide service navigation to individuals who are experiencing more of a systemic concern that falls slightly outside of the scope of a police-related matter. Our main goal is to free up frontline officers to focus more on policing, without having to worry about what resources the family has in place um, now that there are internal social workers who can assist. Sarah and I are an internal resource for our officers and we don't offer case management, but like I mentioned, we offer more service navigation. As mentioned, we have our mental health support team and this team consists of a non-uniformed or plain closed officer and working with a Your Support Service Network uh, worker who attends uh, occurrences in an unmarked car. They respond to mental health calls such as calls involving suicidal ideations, um, addictions, where the person's experiencing signs of mental distress. Part of their responsibilities include advocating at the hospital for the clients, facilitating subsequent follow-ups if required uh, with community resources, providing resources and supports for families and clients, and for clients who do not uh, attend the hospital, just assisting with developing that crisis management plan with them. So we have two teams for the entire region. Mental health support team one um, is that they're both available 12 hours per day. And uh, we have one team for the South, which includes Richmond Hill, Vaughan and Markham. And then we have a team for the North, which includes Newmarket, Aurora, King and Georgina. Just to give you an idea of how busy these teams can be, in 2022, 
York Regional Police attended 7,505 mental health related incidences for service, and this ac accounts for approximately 21 calls per day, which is more than a 60% increase since the beginning of 2017. York Region has one of the fastest growing regions in Canada, where one in five residents will be um, 65 years and old, or older by the year 2031. That's less than 10 years away and accounts for more than approximately 20% of our population who will be considered seniors. And for the first time in history, we are seeing seniors outnumbering children under the age of 16 in Canada. And experts have coined this crossover as the silver tsunami, where there'll be an increase in the longevity of baby boomers in comparison to the rate of children being born. And for those of you who are wondering what age range um, categorizes a baby boomer, it's those who are born between the years 1946 and 1964. With our aging demographic, just think about how our infrastructure, healthcare services, long-term care services will be impacted. Each town and each municipality faces its own unique challenges in this respect. Although we share a common thread, which is will supply be able to, pay, uh, to keep pace with the uh, unprecedented demands, from what we can see so far, families and caregivers are some of the most directly affected group of this demographic shift, such as experiencing longer than wait um, health for healthcare services, as well as an increased demand for housing. With the growing population of older adults, York, Region, um, York Regional Police have devoted two officers called our senior safety officers to assist in occurrences related to this population segment. So Danielle and Aaron are senior safety officers who provide assistance on senior related matters that require additional follow-up. They also provide presentations on crime prevention, crimes against seniors, elder abuse, frauds and scams. And these two senior safety officers are responsible for the entire region of York and are an amazing resource to tap into. So um, I'm just gonna pause here to see if Aaron might want to add anything else. Sorry, I was just getting my video going again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have a great partnership with our social workers and uh, lots of other elder abuse investigators throughout the region. So uh, I think you pretty much summed it up, Chantel. But if there's any other questions, anybody can reach out anytime. Wonderful. Thanks, Erin. We also have the senior safety team. So that consists of the two senior safety officers as well as myself and we specialize in working with older adults and we work collaboratively, like Erin said, um, on responding to reports involving older adults and vulnerable persons. I think a great benefit of us working together is that we develop creative approaches to provide support to clients um, and it can improve our, our interactions with them. Um, we come from different backgrounds. We have the social worker lens, and then we also have the criminal code lens. And through these diverse perspectives, it really helps us develop innovative ways to provide assistance and support. I have included our contact details on the screen, as well as a summary of what, um, what we each can, can offer and provide. So I'll give it a minute before I move on. So our team typically receives referrals from frontline officers, as well as communi community agencies where there is um, individuals that are more likely to have police contact. We respond to police reports where there is an adult above the age of 60 or 60 and above. And the common situations that we encounter would be family disputes and geriatric mental health. Um, now, this can occur when families might dispute over how to care for their older adults. Uh, we see calls from family members who can't quite agree on how to parent their, their loved one. And from older adults who believe that their family is kind of encroaching on their space. Uh, driving complaints, 
where the person might appear disoriented and having problems with things like judgments. And it can make it difficult not only for themselves, but other drivers. And it's a it can be a very hard conversation to have, especially with the prospect of someone losing their license. Um, we also see calls on elder abuse. This includes physical, psychological, sexual, financial abuse, as well as neglect. And uh, I want to make sure to add, we are not an investigative unit, but we can offer assistance um, to clients and um, provide support. We also have seen a rise in home takeovers and um, home takeovers occur when there is a vulnerable tenant and they're forced to accommodate an unwanted guest. Um, the vulnerable tenant might initially allow that person into their home in order to fulfill some form of social, um, economical, or maybe personal need. However, in the process, that person is often psychologically abused when they ask that person to leave. It's that guest who never wants to leave situation. Uh, false allegations against others. This uh, encompasses being suspicious of people around them, which can involve accusing others of things like theft, misconduct, or um, of others of improper behavior, primarily due to lack of capacity. Uh, then we have frauds and scams, which is a deliberate misrepresentation of truth or concealment of material to induce someone to act. And that can be those pesky CRA calls that we get, the grandparent scams, the romance scams. And last but not least, we have vulnerable persons and missing incidences. And that's what I'm going to be focusing mainly on today. All right. So before I delve into this section, I'm hoping to get some feedback from everyone in order to get a better understanding of where the audience is from today. So in a moment, I'm gonna ask you, um, I'm gonna ask if you work with someone or know someone that has a special need to raise your hands or you can even use the emoji. But before you do that, let me just clarify um, about what um, that special need might look like. It could be someone who might be in need of community care services, um, might have a developmental disability, physical disability, fascination or attraction to dangerous locations, um, unusual social responses, oversensitivity to sensory stimulus, or maybe unable to take care of themselves or protect themselves against a significant harm. Okay, so with that said, please raise your hands if you work with someone or know someone that has this special need. And I'm gonna be relying on my friends, Jamie and Aaron to let me know roughly how many people in attendance today raise, um, have their hands raised. Okay. So Chantal, there are eight people who have raised their hands. Okay. Okay. So for those who've raised their hands, there's def the, the next few programs that we're we'll discussing will definitely be of help to you. And I'm sure that you all, even though you might not have raised your hands, can appreciate wanting to help and provide some further awareness for this population. So what is a vulnerable person? Our working definition of what it is, it's a person who is living with a cognitive, physical, intellectual, developmental disability, or any other condition that might place them at an increased risk of misadventure, leading to injury or death, or who may require assistance from emergency assistance. There is no age limitation on what it means to be vulnerable, and it can also include individuals um, living with autism, dementia, an acquired brain injuries, uh, injury, tendency to wander, inability to communicate, um, or um, they might uh, experience unusual social responses. So here are some additional um, individuals who might also have a special need. So individuals with a physical disability, sensory impairment, poor judgment, disorientation to time and place, Okay. 
So in 2005, we launched our vulnerable person registry. And in 2018, we enhanced the program by going fully digital. So this is a program that would allow for an improved police response to vulnerable persons who may require emergency assistance due to their condition. It expedites the process of locating and assisting vulnerable residents or frequent visitors to New York region by making essential personal information readily available to our officers. So a good example of this is we have participants on our registry who might be diabetic. And when their sugar levels are impacted, they can behave uncharacteristically. Being on the registry would allow first responders to be able to be aware of their insulin dependency and provide emergency assistance. Another example is that we have participants on our registry who, have, um, who might be sensitive to um, lights and sounds um, and respond more strongly and deeply than others do. As a result, they may tend to run away from loud noises and lights. And this information is very much essential for our first responders to be aware of, especially um, if they're going to be attending, um, they can be more mindful of how they use their lights and sirens. In order to be eligible for the program, the person must be a resident of the region and have a health condition where they're more likely to have contact with the first responder. There are no age restrictions. And in order to ensure that our database is accurate, we do request that caregivers notify us when there are significant changes to the person's information. And this could be a significant change in their appearance, their address, um, or their health condition. In addition, we do ask for renewals every one to two years. For participants above the age of 16, renewals are done every two years. And for participants under the age of 16, it's done every year. And the reason being is that um, participants under the age of 16, their parents are changing more rapidly. So we wanna make sure that we're capturing those details. Um, I also wanna add that our program is 100% voluntary and it's 100% free. It's essentially a proactive opportunity to share information about the participants with first responders. In the event of an emergency, the Bumble Person Registry uh, provides police with access to helpful information about participants, such as their health condition, uh, suggested methods of uh, de-escalation techniques, and we really do view caregivers as an expert on their loved one's behavior. They may have learned special phrases, words, or techniques that can be helped uh, or help to reduce the anxiety of the participant. For instance, um, a nickname, speaking in short sentences, avoid touching the person. Whatever the technique or whatever the helpful technique that is used, uh, we encourage registrants to share that information on the application so our first responders might be able to utilize the same technique where possible. Uh, emergency contacts. So this would be the primary and secondary contact for the person. It could be a power of attorney, a family member, a friend, doctor, um, caregiver. It is someone who provides that primary care and has a responsibility for the participants. We also ask for a detailed description and the more in depth the description, the better. Um, one of the things I do appreciate about the registry is the inclusion of a picture, as a picture is worth a thousand words. It's one thing to say that Mr. Brown has, or Mr. Smith has brown eyes and um, brown hair, but it's another thing to see a picture um, of and the details that that picture has. Ways to communicate. We have a lot of diverse communities in York region. In fact, there are over 120 languages spoken with the top three languages being spoken at home being Cantonese, Mandarin, and Iranian. So with so many languages, we do ask for participants' preferred language to be included on the application in order for our first responders to be able to communicate with the participants in their preferred language. In addition to the type of language the person communicates in, we also have participants on our registry who are nonverbal. 
So knowing the, the person's ability to communicate is vital as it provides officers with further understanding if the individual is unable to respond to a request or is um, choosing or they're not complying. Um, our registry provides first responders with more insight to that participant. As far as what is new, uh, we have notified existing participants of a, part a partnership that we have with paramedics through our disclaimer. And we've also enhanced our online application process with a quick edit feature, just to allow the um, caregivers to renew the application a lot faster. We were finding that when our officers engage with a vulnerable person or a person in distress, that person would seldom have ID or identification on them and we're having a hard time in communicating their needs. We all know that when someone is anxious, it can be very difficult to get that message across. Now, when you add things um, like feelings of stress or um, that it, it heightens the situation, um, especially if they're in contact with a first responder, it can increase one's physiological arousal, um, resulting in communication being impacted. So to assist clients who have communication challenges or experiencing special needs, we created the vulnerable person ID cards. These cards are about the size of a credit card and it's foldable and it can be used in conjunction with our own person registry or project lifesaver programs, or it can be um, in isolation of both programs where you don't need to be a participant in order to receive these cards. Um, it provides a physical and fillable tool that can be easily kept in one's pockets, their wallets, their backpack purse, whereby care caregivers can provide concise details about the participants. Uh, the card provides officers with quick access to critical information about the person, and it's meant to be carried on them in order to provide the quick details to emergency services if they're unable to provide that information for themselves. So on the card, it lists things like special needs, healthcare conditions that that person might have, life-sustaining medication needs, how that person might display when they're experiencing feelings of distress, um, and su suggestions on how the client can be assisted. If you're interested in ordering these cards for your clients, please feel free to email me at vpr at yrp.ca with your name and the name of your organization, as well as the amount of cards that you might need, as well as your, your mailing address. So I'll keep this on for another moment, vpr at yrp.ca. Okay. So before I discuss our last program, I would like to spend a few moments just talking about exit seeking and wandering behavior. There are a lot of terms to describe the behavior such as absconding, loping, missing person, and you might hear people use these words interchangeably. Wandering can be defined as when a person requires some level of supervision to be safe, leaves a safe and supervised place, and exposes themselves to a potential danger. It is a direct result of physical changes in the brain and may occur at any time of the day and leave that person outdoors, which can expose them to dangers like traffic or dangerous weather conditions. The behavior is not age specific and it can occur in children as well as adults. Um, it can be goal oriented where the behavior is repetitive and the uh, person appears to be searching for something or someone, uh, a goal-directed wanderer may appear to be a little bit more agitated um, when interrupted, and they may attempt to leave to perform a task. So another way of putting it is, the person may receive a sensory input, like hearing music off in a distance, like an ice cream truck, um, then they get distracted by it, and then they seek out attention or stimulus at a time when the caregiver might be very busy. Wandering can also be non-goal oriented and characterized by short attention span and lack of a specific destination. It can be associated with more of a fight or flight response and due to sensory overloads like loud music, camera flashes, 
they may tend to withdraw and remove themselves from these situations. So why is this so dangerous? Has anyone heard of the golden window for a search? I'm just gonna see, hands up or thumbs up if you've heard of it. Okay, I'm gonna guess by no response from Jamie or Aaron that we haven't heard of it. Actually, there yeah. are about three people who have heard about it. Wonderful, okay, okay. All right, so for those of you who haven't heard of the golden window, it is said that this is the period of time that is vital in order to find the person right away. So when someone living with a dementia displays wandering or exit seeking behavior and are found within the first 12 hours, 93% survive. Of those who go missing for 24 hours, these findings are a little bit more sobering where only one third will survive. Of those who go missing for 72 hours, um, one fifth are found alive, which is why it is so important to call 911 as soon as possible and not wait 24 hours like some TV shows might suggest. It can also be especially dangerous uh, for a person who has a dementia who wanders because that person might not ask anyone for directions they might not remember their name or their address, or they might not even tell anyone where they're going. Um, the risk for uh, misadventure increases with someone living with a cognitive impairment, such as drowning, uh, exposure to elements, hypothermia, more likely to have um, encounters with strangers and traffic injuries. I have a question, Chantel. Oh, okay. So just a question from somebody in the audience. How would the police know that a senior is carrying that card when you were talking about the um, the card in the pocket previously, especially if they have Alzheimer's? Great question. So we do encourage that anyone who is requesting the card, that it is something that they would have to provide, but our officers um, would be able to like to... We, we do ask that that person can put it in their pocket, um, their wallet. And when an officer is encountering them, that is those are places that they tend to, to look. Okay. Um, so the video I'm going to show you next is unedited. And it's of a former Project Lifesaver caregiver by the name of Joanne. She is a well, she was a caregiver for um, our, our on our project Lifesaver program for several years, and she is an advocate for our program and agreed that I could show um, this video and share her story for anyone who was considering the program or wanted to know a little bit more about it. Um, sadly, weeks before we did this press conference, her mother passed away due to health complications. And although Joanne was breathing and nervous during the press release, she wanted to attend still in order to get her message across to others. So I'm going to show you this, this full video and um, ask you some questions afterwards. I'm a little bit nervous because I've had to come to a very sad place today. My mom passed away. January 28th of this year and um, she meant everything to me. Um, she got lost on January 15th, 2015. Her driver lost her actually. It was cold and it was snowing and very windy that night. There were so many police officers on the ground looking for her, family, friends, and the helicopter couldn't see the footsteps because there were too many people. I thought the helicopter couldn't see the footsteps. The, uh, the helicopter couldn't track my mother because there were too many people on the ground. Basically, I kept worrying about her hands being frozen. I kept worrying about you know, how she was feeling. And it wasn't until she was found in the morning by a very nice gentleman in his car uh, he warmed her up, he gave her tea, he took very good care of her. 
it wasn't then until I realized that nothing was able to, no one was able to really save her, even modern technology. I had no idea that the Project Lightsaber bracelet existed. No idea. I had placed a GPS bracelet on her arm. She was offended and put it there to track her walking because she was a really good walker. And it tracked her heartbeat. But the GPS isn't good enough. At least it wasn't back then. The battery life wears out. But the Project Lifesaver bracelet lasts months. So honestly, uh, this was the worst thing that could ever happen to someone. I'm talking about it now. My hands are shaking um, because I've had to revisit. I'm in the environment. I have these wonderful police officers around me, and I'm feeling it. <laughs> but um, they were very helpful. Um, they were very comforting. That helped quite a bit. But the bracelet would have saved her. She had a heart attack that night. Her little ankle was bleeding from the blisters from the back of her boots. Sadly, she was door knocking. She was looking for me. She knew her address. She knew where she lived. She just couldn't find her way back home. So the last person that called because they had seen her. I met with that person years later by coincidence. She apologized to me for turning my mother away at 8.30 p.m. That was hard. That was really hard. She said, I'm sorry. I mean, with all the home invasions around, I'm thinking to myself, home invasion. She's tinier than me and senior, and she was turned away by people. I can't believe that to today, when people are diagnosed with dementia, they're not wearing this bracelet automatically. It should be a no-brainer. Diagnosed with dementia, bracelet. And um, my mom ended up living at Sunrise of Richmond Hill. And uh, not everyone is fortunate that can live in a retirement home that caters to the entire family in a beautiful room overlooking Young Street. My mom uh, kept that bracelet on regardless of all the security that she had. And one of the staff once said, why don't you take it off now? She's not walking much. That bracelet will never come off. I cut it off her wrist um, the day before she died because it was interfering with her IV and she wasn't walking anymore. Um, because I know the story of a gentleman, sorry, this is hard, but I, I do want the message put across. Um, I didn't know him personally. I know that his dementia was very far advanced. He went missing in one of the local hospitals and he was found three years later in a boiler pipe. He made his way into the pipe, but he couldn't make his way out. And if he had the bracelet on, they may have found him. Um, I just think that everyone that is diagnosed with dementia, I'm not sure about the other mental disorders, but I know that dementia or Alzheimer's dementia, Louis body, whatever type of dementia, the bracelet should be worn. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here, but I'm totally um, very uncomfortable talking about this since she's just died, but every loved one should wear it if they have dementia. Remember that. <laughs> That's all I really want to say today. Thank you. So part of the education that the senior safety officers and I will offer would be some strategies to be able to help someone in need. Um, you know, reassuring that person if they're feeling distressed, asking them for things like their name, look out to see if there's any identification on them, um, see if they're hurt, if they're injured, are they dressed appropriately for the weather, and call us, call 911 if, um, if you're concerned that, that someone is, um, is in distress. With this said, um, after watching the video, do you, were you surprised by anything that she said or did you find anything um, that stood out to you? 
and feel free to unmute yourself for this. Are there any questions so far before I move forward? No questions have come in. Um, Aaron, did you see anything? Oh. Yeah, there was uh, one comment um, just asking if someone is found without their card on them or ID, if the officers are trained to look at the vulnerable person list to ascertain if they are on it. Um, I did briefly answer it, just saying that would be part of the steps taken. Yes. Um, but hopefully the family would come forward to report them missing or connect them sooner. But additional steps would be taken to follow up possibly with hospitals um, or other reports of someone missing. Um, we wouldn't just be letting them go, especially if we feel that they're vulnerable. I hope that answers that question. Okay, anything exactly. else to add, Chantal? Nope. Uh, well somebody said. actually did ask about how the air tag would actually play in effect as a possibility for a, a tracker as well. So the air tag is a, another locating um, technology that can be used. It uses GPS technology. So the air tag allows for um, the caregiver to be able to to monitor that person's whereabouts. Um, now, there's advantages and there's disadvantages with the GPS as there is with any program. Um, part of the disadvantage is depending on um, it, the, the GPS itself, it doesn't pick up a strong signal if the person is underground. Similar like if you're using your GPS and you're going underground, your, your signal is not as strong. Um, so, there is other technologies out there, and one of the ones I'm going to be talking about very shortly is the Project Lifesaver one, and that uses radio frequency technology to help locate a missing vulnerable person. Are there any other questions before I continue? Okay. All right. So with that said, oops. The Project Lifesaver program. Okay, so this, like I mentioned, this is a program for individuals who have a tendency to display exit seeking behavior. And it's a technology that combines a um, FM radio technology with radio uh, coordinated, uh, coordinated police response to allow officers to be able to locate missing bumble persons. Um, so the way that it works is that the client is enrolled and wears the device on their wrist. And when the client is reported missing, our search and rescue team will attend the last place that the person was seen, set up their equipment, and can be able to help locate them based on the unique frequency that that person is wearing. Um, it has been also proven to be able to track through a lot of obstacles like concrete and heavily forested areas. I'm not going to spend too much time going through how it works because I'm going to show you a video of one of our search and rescue officers explaining about it in more depth. Um, but like I mentioned, the participant would wear the bracelet. They would have to wear it 24 hours. So if this is a program that you're thinking about for someone, they would have to be comfortable in wearing that device all the time. And it's completely water resistant. So they can shower with it, they can bathe with it, they can do all their day-to-day -day tasks with it. Um, and uh, it doesn't require being charged, unlike a GPS where you have to plug it in on a regular basis. The great thing about uh, Project Lifesaver is that the batteries last for a very long time. In fact, they last for 60 days. Okay, so one, this is our, um, this is our search and rescue expert, Pete Gurlad, and he's going to be discussing how the Project Lifesaver equipment works. The Project Lifesaver system uh, involves these three, two components plus uh, the radio transmitter, which is attached to the client uh, in the form of a wristband that looks similar to a watch. Uh, the way the system works is the transmitter transmits a specific FM radio frequency. Uh, it's different for each client and specific. 
and the receiver then will receive that frequency and using a directional antenna will help guide us towards the bracelet and thus the clamp. Uh, this technology is proven, it's uh, not modern, it's FM radio frequencies have been around for years and years. Uh, the system in the past has been used to track wildlife in the most remote areas of the world uh, with success. Uh, compared to something like GPS and modern technology, there are some limiting factors similar to getting uh, uh, GPS reading on your phone in remote areas, uh, underneath a canopy with heavy cloud cover that might influence a GPS signal. Uh, FM radio frequencies do not have those limiting factors. Um, we have our demonstrator, Chantel, in the woods, and I can show how this system works if I turn it on. Simple system for an operator to use. All our search and rescue members on our team are trained on how to use this unit. We have units across the region in every district uh, in York Region for a rapid response. Uh, as I was saying, this, uh, the direction is uh, the antenna is directional in nature. So as I spin it around and do a search, my signal will get stronger or weaker depending on the location of the subject. You can hear the, the beep of uh, the transmitter. I'm pointed in the direction of where our suspect, our subject is supposedly at. And as I turn away from it, we have a lighter signal. Because we're in a close proximity, we're still going to get some of an FM radio signal. But uh, when I point towards them, the signal gets stronger. As an operator, I'll continue to walk towards the person dialing in the equipment. And if you have a look at our dial corresponding with the sound will give us a reading. And if I point away from the subject, the dial's not showing any uh, movement. So I have a clear direction of where my subject is. As you can see, I found my subject. The signal is strong. You can hear the uh, pulse as we're very close to her. So uh, when we follow the simple tactics of listening for the tone and watching our dial, we're at a very rapid rate brought in to the proximity of the transmitter. Okay, so the fee, the cost for the program, the fee for registration has actually increased to $419. Because it's an American program, the fee is also going to be in American dollars. As far as what's new is that through the help of a subsidy and very generous donors, we are now able to load the equipment to eligible participants for free with certain provisions. And for uh, families who are uncertain if their loved one will wear the bracelet, we are also offering trials of the bracelet, which is just the casing, just to see if, the, if they um, will wear the bracelet for a period of time. If you think that you know someone who might be a good candidate for this program, please do direct them to us at projectlifesaver at yrp.ca and we'll be happy to follow up with them. Okay, so in communicating with our vulnerable person and Project Lifesaver participants, we received uh, some interest in addressing the needs of participants who are mobile in their community and have special needs that might not be as prevalent to the casual observer. So someone that might have diabetes or someone that might be experiencing a non-visible disability. We took a look, a look to see what's currently out there in the community to communicate with someone or um, individuals with a special need. And as you can see by the images on the screen, there are many different programs out there in the market right now with most of them communicating uh, the specific need that person experiences, such as the person being neurodivergent, living with a cognitive impairment, might have a hearing impairment. 
There were even stickers that would alert others if there was an animal in the home in case of an emergency or an evacuation was needed. With the assistance of our community partners, we created a, a design that we wanted to be evergreen. So we wanted something that was gonna be able to stand the test of time and avoid the redundancy of having every agency creating their own thing. We wanted to create something that was gonna be representative of all of our clients with special needs. Uh, we wanted it to be subtle and avoid language that might target participants by non-users. We wanted it to be recognizable to our first responders. And we wanted it to be PHIPAA compliant and avoid sharing personal health information about that person um, to avoid being targeted um, or easily accessed by the public. Essentially, we wanted to create a tool for first responders to utilize in an effort to recognize and assist vulnerable persons with a special need. And we called this sticker the Vulnerable Person Decal, or VPD for short. As far as the eligibility criteria, it's suitable for someone with a cognitive, physical, intellectual, or, de or developmental disability, or any other condition that may place them at an increased risk for misadventure, which can include someone um, that might have a tendency to wander, an inability to communicate, uh, fascination or attraction to dangerous locations, or an unusual res uh, social response. In order to maintain the program integrity, the DECAL is only available for participants who are currently on our vulnerable person registry and project lifesaver programs, since the additional information about the participant, like their um, emergency contact details, their special needs, that would, is, that would be relayed to first responders through the application itself. Um, so that's why it's, only for those participants. Um, in addition, as it is a York Region program, it's important to keep in mind that the level, um, that it will only be available for residents of York Region. After completing the program, so the um, person registry or the vulnerable, per vulnerable person registry or the Project Lifesaver program, caregivers would review the details about the DECAL and then they can decide whether or not they would like to receive it. If they decide that they don't want the DECAL, it's not gonna impact their eligibility for either two of those programs. Jamie, at this point, I'm going to ask you to stop recording, please. Thanks, Jamie. So I don't see any questions as of yet. Okay. I don't know if Jamie can see any hands up at all. Maybe I no. covered everything. <laughs> there aren't any hands up. If anybody would like to talk, um, please just put it in to the chat in the Q&A and I'd be more than happy to unmute you so you can speak to Chantel. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, you're a very good presenter, Chantal, very thorough. <laughs> She's biased. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, we do actually have some hands up and I'm just going to um, allow uh, Francis, I'm going to unmute you and- Francis. Okay, go ahead, Francis. Well, first, I can't express how exciting it is to see this. Well done. Thank so you. wonderful. Um, and personally and professionally, I say that. So um, I do have a question about how you are going to, and maybe I missed it. Okay. Um, how you're going to evaluate this program so that you can scale and spread it with the learning that you have. Ooh, good question. Um, at this time, I, I, I don't believe that we have, um, we, 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 I don't believe that we have, um, a plan to, to assess it in that capacity. Do you have any suggestions, Francis? I have many and I will follow up. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. <clears throat> this is, this is teamwork. <laughs> any other questions? 
Okay, next we have a very familiar person, Miss Andrea. Andrea. Hello. Hello. I just want to thank you, Chantel, for being so thorough. These are very important programs. <clears throat> Our clients who have dementia, families always think it's never going to happen to me or to my mom or to my dad. And um, sadly, it does. Some Sadly, sometimes with some pretty horrific outcomes, as we heard earlier today with, I mean, luckily the lady was found, but there was a lot of other things that went on. I know personally with a client of mine, he was gone from, I think he left on a Sunday afternoon and was not found until Wednesday. And it could have been really horrible uh, had it not been for um, a person in a grocery store who saw him going back and forth because he'd not eaten for three days. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty horrible. Um, luckily he was able to be returned safely to his family. Um, but you know, it, it, it's a family too, that had said it's not going to happen. And I heard Francis say personally, uh, I lost my grandmother down at the Eaton center. And we also had an incident where she wandered off and we had no idea where she was. Had we been able to have some of these tracking devices available, because this was a long time ago. Um, it would have been helpful. My grandmother had calling cards on her. So like a mm -hmm. business card that had her name and address on. Um, but she didn't sadly think to pull it out. Uh, and she was very determined and she managed to get home. But she was unaccounted for for several hours and it could have been very bad. And then she was lost again at the Eaton Center. Um, so, you know, you can never, never say never. Um, and I welcome York Region Police. They have been a good partner of ours in helping families in the community. And I will tell you, Project Lifesaver, there was another client of mine who got into a car mm -hmm. and uh, they were able to track. One of his sons was a private investigator. Another son was a, a detective with, I think, the OPP. And they were able to find him. Um, with his project Lifesaver, but also with the credit cards because he was filling up for gas every like every gas station and they were able to track him. But, wow. you know, very, 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 you know, I've had clients get on planes pre pre 9-11, mm -hmm. but they were, they were able to get onto a plane and get to England. I've had another one who went for a drive and he ended up in Manitoba. So it's quite astounding what people are able to do. And sadly, the, the uh, outcome is not always good. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all the work that you guys do and thank you. For all the support and working together. We look forward to a, a long partnership to continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We look forward to working with you again. Thanks. And we do have another question. I'm just going to unmute um, Emma. I'm just going to um, unmute you. So you are more than welcome to ask your question. Okay. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. So my mother has Alzheimer's and I did fill out the card and I've put it in her wallet. So my question is, in the event that um, she does experience um, being lost, are, did I hear you say, Chantal, that the police will ask her if there is something in her wallet? Like I, that piece of it, I'm not clear about because she may not remember that I've put that in her wallet. So how would the police know that there is that card? My apologies. Um, That's okay. Maybe you maybe I I tuned out, but just wanted yeah. to confirm I understand. Yeah. So the card is something um, that we ask for participants to be able to give to to someone, so to our first responder. Mm -hmm. um, but officers will 
will look, and maybe Aaron, if you wanna elaborate on this one for me too, um, officers will check certain places to see if the person has any form of identification on them. Um, one of the places that they will look is on the wrist to see if the person is wearing an eye, uh, a medical alert bracelet, but um, looking at pockets, wallets, um, and if the person has the ID card in there that has the additional information, that's how they would um, acquire that information. Okay, so the police will actually make an attempt to look in the wallet, and hopefully the person is not agitated enough that that's going to escalate the situation. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, so being an officer, that when I was working on the road, if we found somebody who maybe looked like they were vulnerable, couldn't communicate where they lived, or they were alone, and we suspected that they needed some assistance, even though individuals' rights, we're not allowed to search people unless they're under arrest. However, in these kind of circumstances, we're doing it for more of a medical purpose um, to try and find where they're from, where there may be some information about a family member. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to take them to the hospital if they don't need to be. We would rather call a family member and have them come and meet us, or we can deliver that person to their home. Um, and then that's where we would probably engage Chantel and start that process to maybe get them on the BPR program if they don't have a card with them. Um, so we will make those attempts ahead of time. Uh, we are aware that people will sometimes um, sew their loved one's names into their clothing on maybe a tag. Um, so we will look for those kind of cues before we just, um, you know, leave them as they are. We want to make sure that they get home. Thank you, Erin. Okay, I don't see any other questions here. Uh, I don't know if this is a good time to take a quick break, Jamie. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Chantel, for that phenomenal and very informative presentation and videos. So at this time, before we move on to Officer Aaron Brown, we are going to take a quick break. So take this opportunity to stand up and stretch and we're going to come back in about 10 minutes. So um, come back all refreshed so we can learn more from Officer Aaron Brown. See you in 10 minutes, everybody. And welcome Officer Aaron Brown. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, yeah, I like to throw those little tidbits in about myself so people kind of realize that I'm a, a person as well and not just a police officer full time. So, um, so I'm going to be doing a uh, quick presentation on some crime prevention items and different things that we share with seniors when we go to presentations out in the community. Um, so a lot of this information is applicable to everyone. However, we do try to gear it towards older adults, um, especially when it comes to being out and about and that personal safety piece. So if there's any information or questions as we go along the way, I again would invite you to put it in the Q&A and Chantel and Jamie will review that and jump in where it's appropriate. Okay. So just to give a quick overview, I mean, Chantel has already spoken about our senior safety team and what that entails. Um, so I won't go over that too much, but I am gonna talk about some top uh, financial fraud scams that we see, um, some crime prevention and personal safety tips. And then I'm going to introduce you to our community safety map and weekly crime stats that you could have available uh, to you as a member of the public and some resources that we have available. So again, there's a picture of our team. We'd like to plug that in. We got that done recently and uh, it's a nice way to showcase our team and um, how we work together collaboratively. Um, again, I'm not gonna go over this uh, too in depth. Chantel covered it uh, in great depth. So I think um, the only other thing that I would like to offer is um, in addition to presentations that we do, um, we also have the opportunity to go and do home visits from time to time if needed. Um, and I do wanna highlight the second point there that we do have elder abuse investigators all throughout the region. So if any uh, criminal offense comes in or gets reported involving a senior, it does have to get reported through the um, the proper chains where a frontline officer will take the information 
or they'll take the information over the phone. We do not take lead as the lead investigators on it if there's a criminal element, but if there's something that we can follow up with the seniors or the family, then we will do so. We'll reach out and like Chantel, we can provide referrals and information as well. So just a little chart here to kind of show, um, again, it's, it's like that silver tsunami that uh, Chantel was talking about in relation to um, the amount of seniors and the growth chart. So that pink line at the bottom is showing the amount of the seniors and how it's increasing. And then children zero to 14, how, um, you know, as of 1986, it was much higher than seniors and now is starting to decline and we have more seniors than children. So it's quite interesting to see the stats and how it's changing so quickly like that. So going into some of the top scams, uh, the first one, I'm sure everybody has heard of this one, the Canada Revenue Agency. Um, so this is a situation where uh, you will get a call, somebody will pretend they're from the CRA, saying you haven't paid your taxes, and they try to talk you into giving money or um, one of the high payment uh, topics that they like to use is to tell you to go to the store, buy some gift cards, uh, return home, and then you do payment by the gift cards um, in order to pay the amount off. So um, we'll talk about some uh, tips on what not to do, but one of the top ones, obviously, gift cards, as soon as you give the information on the card, that will be the barcode on the back and the number under the gray strip, which is uh, called the PIN number. If you get both of those types of information, they have a way of transferring the money off of the card and into their own account. So um, we do still like to highlight this, even though most people are aware of this type of scam, um, because we do still see it happening. And um, typically it does happen more often to seniors as well as those that uh, have English as a second language. Uh, they're here maybe on a permanent resident status, maybe new immigrants, and they become really scared when it comes to these types of things because they think that they may face uh, deportation or get in trouble with the government. Grandparent scams. Um, I'm going to talk about this one in a moment and kind of explain that one. Um, romance scams. Sometimes we get some chuckles in the room when we talk about romance scams, but it's a very real thing, uh, especially over COVID when people have been at home, they're a little lonely, and then they get somebody reaching out to them either by text message, by email, maybe a phone call. Um, but I want to highlight as well that not only romance scams, but sometimes uh, friendship scams can come in the same type of format. And it may come in the way of um, from your cell phone emails, but it could also come in the way of somebody befriending you, maybe while you're out and about. Um, you could even be at the grocery store and they may offer assistance saying, you know, I can help you with this. Oh, you look like you need a little assistance. I could carry your groceries to the car. And then they slowly try and become your friend. Maybe they see you again another time. They offer services to, at the home to maybe come and do some gardening or cleaning for you. And they slowly immerse themselves into your lives. Um, when it comes to other uh, romance scams online, they will probably have some kind of false identity, claim they are someone that they are not. So you may be thinking if you're... Um, you know, in a relationship with a female, you may be thinking you're talking to someone like that, and it could actually be a male and somewhere entirely not where they're saying they're from. Um, so the, be the best thing we always suggest is if somebody calls you and you don't know the number, you don't recognize who the text is from, do not answer it, do not reply. If somebody calls you and they leave you a message, you can decide on how you're going to uh, verify that information and whether you're going to make that phone call or whether you're going to look up the proper phone number for the agency and then call them um, through the appropriate channels. Um, phishing emails, again, this could be information, um, even text messages. I know I'll get texts saying, oh, sorry, I'm running late. I'll send my, my money to you soon. And you're thinking, oh, maybe someone's got the wrong number. And it could just be as simple as texting them back and you know, they may seem very nice, but then they're starting that conversation with you and, oh, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to bother you, but you sound like a really nice person. Can we communicate? Can we talk? Um, or emails uh, or text messages saying that there's an issue with your bank account. It may be TD or CIBC. And if you do have an account with those banks, you may think, well, there's an actual problem. So you may click on the link. You may reach out uh, to that agency through the number that is provided to you on the email. But what I would suggest you do is take the time, 
maybe call the number on the back of your credit card or your debit card or go online, um, maybe call or go into your local bank to see if there's an issue. And most times you will find that there's not actually a problem and it, this is a phishing scam. So ask questions and there's no emergency in any scam. Um, if anything, when it comes to information that people are trying to obtain from you, if it doesn't feel right, if you're not sure, take the time, speak to someone you trust and verify before you give it anything, especially over the phone. So I'm going to touch on emergency scams, which are also known as grandparent scams. So has anybody here heard of these types of scams before? And I'll have to rely on Jamie to see if we got any hands up here. Oh, yes, we have many people raising their hands. They're familiar with it. Yeah, sadly. But I mean, in a good way that people are aware of it and they know about it because our education piece that we're constantly putting out there, um, our media reminders um, it is getting through to people. And the more and more people that we explain this information and share with, then hopefully the less um, victims that we see of this kind of crime. So Usually what will happen is you may get a phone call or you may get a text message and it sounds like it could be a loved one. Uh, they may call saying, Grandma, is that you? Or Nona? Or whatever um, type of greeting that you would normally get from your grandchild or it could even be from a niece or nephew or your own children. And they may say, I've been in trouble, I've been arrested or I've been in a car accident. And after the car accident, then they found some drugs in the car or they found a gun in the car. Um, they could go on and on with uh, various amounts of different excuses as to why they're in jail and why they need bail money to get out of jail. Um, they may even go as far as putting another person on the phone, pretending that they are from the court's office, maybe a bailiff, maybe a judge, justice of the peace, or they might even pretend to be a police officer. They may get on and introduce themselves. And of course, it'll sound very official because these criminals have practiced their and rehearsed their lines. They know exactly what to say. They know how um, those in authority will speak on the phone and the different words and jargon that they will use. And they'll talk to them and say, yes, your grandson has been arrested. These are the reasons why. In order for them to be released from jail, we need approximate amount of money. They could suggest something like $5,000. And of course, they make it sound like it's an extremely urgent matter. And the reason they do this is because they're trying to incite panic and fear into you. And they want you to think, oh my goodness, I have to act on this now, or my grandson or my granddaughter or whomever may not get out of jail. They will then also tell you that there's a gag order and that you're not allowed to tell anybody about this or else your grandson may not get out of jail. I'm going to keep saying grandson, but you get the idea that I'm talking about whomever they're pretending to be. Um, so they may then give direction, um, possibly the senior or the person on the phone may say, well, I don't have $5,000. I would, I I'd have to go to the bank and they would be patient and say, no problem, go to the bank. But when you go to the bank, just keep in mind that there's a gag order and you must not tell them what it's for. Maybe explain to them that, uh, you need the money for a bathroom renovation, or you're doing some landscaping and they will actually coach the person on what to say at the bank. Now this person may go to the bank. The tellers are usually pretty good at asking questions and trying to figure out exactly why they would need such a large amount of money. Um, but at the end of the day, if the senior is persistent or the, the person who's trying to get the money out says, no, I want the money, they have to give it to them. It is their money. Um, so then the next details will come that they'll return home with the money. Um, they'll be given a number to call by the scammers. And once they call, they'll be like, okay, great, put the money in an envelope, and we're going to have someone come to the house. We're going to have one of our couriers from the court come to the house to receive the bail money, and they're going to give a code word. And the code word could be pineapple. So you're thinking, okay, somebody's going to come to the house. Um, now, typically what we've seen is when this courier, this person comes to the house, they may be wearing a mask. Um, like for COVID um, and tell them that, well, I have to wear a mask because, you know, our protocols at work, but really what they're doing is trying to conceal their identity, especially if you have a video camera at home, they're trying to avoid being captured. Uh, they may also park around the corner and walk in a short distance. So they're not captured on your video surveillance or neighbor's video surveillance, parking in front of the house, trying to avoid any kind of identifying information. So they'll come in, they'll say, okay, I'm here for the money 
code word is pineapple. They'll take the envelope and then off they go. So sometimes it ends there. Sometimes the scammers will stop there. But if they think they can get more money, they're going to call again. Um, they could pretend to be the grandson again. And now the, the story could escalate to, okay, well, the accident I was in, there was a pregnant woman in the other car. And now she's really injured and the baby's going to die. So now they need more money. And the scam can go on and on and on. Um, some people will... Um, you know, typically give some money and then maybe kind of catch on and realize, oh, I think I've been scammed and then report. Um, but sadly, we have had some families that have given over $100,000. So um, we want to reiterate as well that we understand this can be very embarrassing for the person um, who's who's been scammed. And maybe they don't come forward because they don't want their family to know what's happened. Maybe they feel silly and they don't want to um, have anyone else know what has happened. So we always encourage um, those that who have been scammed or know somebody's been scammed, please have them come forward. Um, we're trying to capture as much information as we can. And if we can catch the per perpetrators, they will be arrested and charged. Um, now, just to keep in mind as well, this is organized crime. There's different levels in the hierarchy. So typically the ones that we will catch initially will be the ones coming to pick up the money. Through that investigation, we may be able to track others that are involved, but there are multiple multiple different levels. Um, and these criminals will even go as far as renting Airbnb homes and setting up like a call center. So you may think, how do they know my name? How do they know my information? Well, they do their homework. They go on social media. They will go online. They will start doing some research, maybe read local newspapers um, and find out information about you. So if you are receiving a call and your grandchildren typically call you uh, Nana, but they're like, Grandma, Grandma, that should be a red flag and you need to pay attention to those cues. Um, so just to give you an idea of how that all works, I know it's kind of a lengthy explanation, but um, the more times we share this and get it out there, then hopefully people will not fall for the scam. Okay, so I've got a video here on phishing and how they try to get information. Uh, Jamie, just let me know if the audio doesn't work. You got it. Phishing is when a cyber criminal poses as a legitimate organization to try and lure you into providing sensitive data. Sometimes they send you an email or call you asking for your banking or credit card numbers, even your usernames and passwords. This information is then used to access important accounts and can result in identity theft and financial loss. When this is done over SMS text messages, it's referred to as smishing. Here are some of the tactics that might be used by somebody trying to fish or smish you. They might try to scare you by saying your information has already been compromised or threaten to close your account, fine you, or even take legal action if you don't respond. On the other end of the spectrum, some messages will make it seem like you're being rewarded, receiving inheritance from a long-lost relative, winning a contest you've never entered, or getting a refund for something you didn't purchase. Whether they're playing good cop or bad cop, there will often be a sense of urgency to phishing requests. To encourage action without thinking, fishers will often give tight deadlines. No matter the tactic, here are some ways to tell if the messages you receive are actually phishing attempts. Phishing messages can be impersonal, addressing you as sir or madam instead of using your name. They're more likely to have spelling and grammar mistakes or unprofessional graphics than legitimate organizations. They'll also come from a domain unrelated to the company they're pretending to be from. So double check the address when you receive an email by hovering over it with your mouse. Unfortunately, there are fewer clues when it comes to smishing. The best way to determine if a text is fraudulent is just to ask yourself, would this organization be texting me and asking me to take action? In most cases, the answer is no. In fact, stopping and asking yourself that question is a great way to protect yourself from all forms of phishing. If you're still not sure, get in touch with the organization by using the contact information on their official website. If there's really a problem, they'll let you know. Legitimate organizations don't usually ask you to verify or provide confidential information in an unsolicited email or text. Phishing scams are on the rise, but follow these tips and you'll be sure not to take the bait.
Well, it's hard with the webinars because normally you get a few chuckles with the, uh, well, Drake, Ty, and text me. So I'm hoping you're laughing at home. <laughs> All right. So just some reminders here on how to avoid being scammed. Uh, verify the information. Never offer any information or check in with a family member if you're in doubt or someone you trust. Uh, keep in mind that there's always a police officer working. So if you can't find somebody in the time that you need, you could always call the police station or ask one of us. Um, the second point there is delayed disconnect. So I don't know if any of you have uh, ever remembered this when you're on your home phone, maybe a friend calls you and I'm probably dating myself a little bit now, you know, when you're talking to your friends when you're a teenager um, and, um, you know, if they don't hang up right away, you hang up from the call, but then you go to pick up to make another call and they're still on the line. That would be what we call a delayed disconnect. So on home lines, if you do get a call from someone and you think they might be a scammer, try to wait at least 10 minutes before using your phone again and make sure that there's a dial tone when you pick it up. This doesn't work so much with cell phones, more so just with landlines. Uh, don't give cash or checks to anyone you don't know. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and don't give anyone access to your computer unless you know them personally, trust them, or they're from a reputable company that's uh, maybe working on your computer to fix it. And again, the reminder about gift cards, once you give that information, it's very difficult to reimburse uh, for the money that is lost. So if you are a victim, especially when it comes to frauds, um, we suggest contacting your bank first so they can um, put a hold on your account or prevent any further frauds or loss of funds, and then contact your regional police. So we also want to ensure that you coll uh, collect and keep all evidence. So this could be emails, it could be video surveillance, um, any kind of notes that you might have written from a conversation that you had, any re audio recordings, um, especially when it comes to video surveillance. If you have a home video surveillance system and it records over itself after a period of time, maybe a three-day period, you want to make sure that you make um, a record of that video, put it in a separate file and make sure it's safe so it doesn't get recorded over. Um, if there's any demands, cryptocurrency information, uh, sometimes they will, you know, there, there's different confidence scams where they may say that um, your bank account's been compromised from an inside fraud, from um, maybe somebody working at the bank. They may direct you to go to a cryptocurrency machine, start up an account and transfer your funds in there. But in real fact, they're actually going to have access to that account to take the money from you. If you're um, involved in maybe uh, an investment scam, you think it's a good investment, it looks like you're making money, and then all of a sudden you lose your funds or something happens, um, but you've notified others um, prior to that happening and they could be impacted, make sure you let them know as well so they can take the steps to protect themselves. And contact the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre to re report the scam. Only five to 10% of all scams are actually reported to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. So if you do go on their website and check out their information, just be mindful that the numbers are uh, much higher, probably up, up over 10 times higher of what's actually happening in Canada. Uh, some tips when you're out and about, and this is more of a personal safety piece, um, always be aware of your surroundings. Um, try and travel in pairs when possible. And this is for all people, not just seniors. But specifically with seniors as well, um, we find that people may try to take advantage of them, especially if they are alone, because um, they may find them to be um, perhaps an easier target if they think that could, they could steal items from them. Try and travel in well-lit and populated areas, especially at night and early mornings. Um, have a flashlight with you, maybe um, put reflective strips on your shoes or walking devices so you can be seen better by motorists. And carry a cell phone, make sure it's fully charged and have a noisemaker. Uh, so this could be a whistle, it could be some kind of clacker, whatever that may draw attention to yourself. Um, I know um, you probably heard it in the past where somebody says to yell fire instead of maybe yelling rape if you're in trouble. Um, again, it just depends on who's paying attention and who's going to come to your aid. So the more noise you make, you might get more attention. Tell family and friends your destination, where you're going, when you um, plan on arriving and coming home. Um, I know as we get older, we don't want to feel like we're being monitored by our loved ones. However, something simple like that, like I'm going to be going out running uh, errands all day, I'm going to hit the mall, and then I should be home around dinner time. It just lets them know that you're okay, you're safe. Um, and then if something should happen to you, 
when you're not home at that time, then they can maybe report to police that you might be missing or they can't find you and seek assistance. And again, that golden uh, timeline that we talked about with Chantel, that it's very important for us to get started as soon as possible. Don't wear headsets that could compromise your hearing. Um, and if you wear glasses, hearing devices, I know it's frustrating when we hit that point in our life where we have to use them and we're not used to it, but I suggest you do and I encourage you to do so. It's going to help you in the long run and it's going to make you safer, um, not only from maybe people walking up behind you that you can't hear, um, but if you're not seeing properly and it's not well lit, you might trip and fall and hurt yourself and uh, an injury could take a long time to heal from. Um, call police if you see anything suspicious. Don't take any shortcuts through parks or alleys. That's all kind of a uh, given information there. Um, if there's any questions, let me know as we go. Uh, right now, we're going to talk about distraction thefts. This seems to be um, a big issue all over Canada. And we want to highlight that distraction thieves work in teams and often approach their victims in busy locations. So you can see from the image there, someone is shopping, not paying attention. And for those of you who leave your purse in the cart open, not attended to, I'm gonna scold you now and ask that you please don't do that anymore. Um, we even suggest not taking large bags with you or purses when you're going shopping, maybe having a fanny pack or some kind of small crossbody purse um, that you can conceal on you a little bit better. So, um, they will oft, often distract you. It could be something as simple as talking to you about uh, Greek yogurt and whatever you're shopping for. And then when you're not paying attention, their partner could come in and take your items. This could also happen when you're filling up your car with gas. Um, and actually we've uh, seen a rash of um, car accidents recently where someone will do a, a minor fender bender and then they will distract you and maybe take your items or even steal your car. Um, don't let yourself be distracted. Keep your wallet and purse with you at all times. Um, if you're shopping and you've got all of your identification with you, maybe start to rethink about what you take with you. Um, if you're taking your passport with you to go shopping, it's probably not ideal. I don't think anybody's going on a big vacation to Loblaws. So uh, leave it at home. Your SIM card should be left at home. The only time you need that is when you're applying for a job or paying taxes. So there's no reason for you to have it on you at all times. And when you're shopping, don't leave purchases in plain sight in your vehicle, especially if you're having a great day shopping at the mall, you're walking out with a ton of, of bags and you go to put them in your car, thinking I'm going to go in for round two, especially around Christmas time. We're going to have a lot of people that are going to pay attention to that and uh, may prey on you or break into your vehicle if they see the opportunity. So in this video that I'm going to show you here, this is a distraction theft involving um, somebody that's in the neighborhood that just randomly chats to a person in their driveway, and then they're talking about jewelry that they're selling. So I'm going to play it at the same time. There's no sound for this video. But you can see the lady there that's talking to um, another lady in the driveway. And, um, you know, and, and you're thinking, oh, if a lady approaches me, it's not going to be that serious. You're not as intimidated. And you can see the the one that's approached has put a necklace on her. And what she's doing is doing up the necklace she's just put on her, but also removing the necklace that the ladies are was previously wearing. And you see her just palm it there in her hand. So she's pretending like she's adjusting it. The new necklace probably weighs about the same as the other one. So it's not something you would readily notice. And then you're thinking, well, that was kind of nice or strange, but kind of nice of her. But then of course it wouldn't be until she's already left that you notice that your actual jewelry is missing. Uh, vehicle safety. This is really important when you're out and about as well. Maintain your vehicle, have it in good working condition. Um, make sure that in cold months you don't start your car and leave it running unless you have the ability to lock it while you do so with a car starter. Make sure your gas tank is at least half full. Always have your vehicle locked when you're, um, even when you're sitting in it, you just never know who's going to come and open the door when you're not paying attention. Uh, park in a highly visible, well-lit location. Try not to park near any bushes where somebody could hide behind. And have your keys re and remote ready as soon as you approach your car. Uh, don't walk with, you know, like you're fumbling for your keys in your purse, you're looking down, you're not paying attention. Do a quick quick check of the back seat and vehicle interior just to make sure that if you had left it unlocked that you're not um, going to be ambushed by anyone. 
and be aware of your surroundings. Uh, if you're wearing a headset, maybe have one ear um, pulled out so you can hear what's happening. Don't be distracted by looking at your phone and walking around. Pay attention. Uh, we also find too, if you actually make eye contact with somebody and you see them and they acknowledge that you've seen them, they're less likely to um, create any kind of issue with you or maybe try and steal your items because now you've seen them and you can identify them. So this goes for when you're walking down uh, a sidewalk and you maybe hear somebody coming up behind you, especially if they're walking a little faster than you. Uh, we always suggest turn around, have a look at them and maybe encourage them to go around you. Um, then that way, again, it may foil their plans like, oh darn, what am I gonna do now? They've seen me, okay, well, maybe I'll pick on the next person. So I talked about this briefly, carjacking. Um, there has been some media releases about this recently where um, you'll have uh, distraction thieves working in a car, maybe rear end you. And then when you get out of the car to see the damage, they could um, take your vehicle um, and, and take off with it, possibly in a, in a violent way. So if somebody is trying to steal your car and they seem to be violent, you're better just to let them have it. Obviously, if there's other family members in the car or pets, try and get them out if you can. Um, but don't fight with a carjacker. Just tell them they can have it. At the end of the day, you've got to think of it like it's a piece of property. And we would rather you be safe than injured. Again, this is just a, a refresher on robbery prevention. Criminals are opportunists. Walk confidently, know where you're going. Um, avoid being overburdened, well-lit areas. So again, it's just... Um, just some reminders there. Bank machines, when you're getting money out, be aware of who's around you who may be looking to see what your PIN number is or how much money you're taking out. We also suggest if you're going into a teller, and sometimes the tellers have to count the money out to you, that they do it in a quiet manner instead of, you know, in a loud 20, 40, 60, 80, and then next thing you know, everybody in the bank knows you're taking 500 bucks out. Um, it just creates opportunity for somebody who may want to take advantage of you. If you're being, um, if you're walking out at nighttime and you're not sure of who's around you, ask for somebody to walk you out to your vehicle, whether it's an employee or security at the mall. Okay. Oops. Sorry about that. Just had a pop up there. Okay. Can you guys see the crime map? Okay. No. Oh, go back. Yeah, yeah, we could it's, see we could see it. It's weird. Oh, it's, it's blacked out. It's blacked out, and I'm not sure what's happening there. I could see it before. Okay, so um, sadly, we do have a crime map safety data portal. Um, I'm just going to tell you about it, but you won't be able to actually see it on here. Um, but if you oh, see, it keeps jumping around. Okay, I'm going to skip that one and leave it here. So if you go to our website at uh, www.yrp.ca. As soon as you pull the website up, up in the top right hand corner, you will see access to our online uh, data safety portal. And it will take you to a screen where you can actually plug in information and see what kind of crimes are happening in your neighborhood, in your town or city that you live in. And then there's also the opportunity to be able to sub subscribe to weekly crime summary, which I'm showing you here. And it will show you how many offenses under what kind of crime category happened in the last week, uh, happened the previous week, and what the variance is as to whether the crime is going up or down. So if you're worried about home break-ins happening in your neighborhood, you can go on this and get a weekly update and kind of get an idea of things that you maybe need to pay attention to. Um, we do have some people that are fearful of their home being broken into, but this could help alleviate your mind on whether something like that is actually happening. We also have a security camera registry. Um, so this is an important feature um, in relation to if you have a home security system. Now, we don't actually have direct access to your camera. That's not what this is for. What it is, is it allows us to know that you have um, a security camera at your home. Should there be a crime that happens in the area, we can add you to an email list. And if something happens, we can send out a blast to everybody in the area saying, okay, a crime happened on this date, there was a theft of a vehicle, can you please check your camera between this time and this time? And then it will be up to you as a homeowner to check to see if you have any evidence of that incident or any information that might help. 
if you do, then we can we can follow up with you, provide you a secure link to our digital evidence management system, and then you can upload that video yourself. Um, again, we don't have access to your actual camera system. This is all with your permission uh, and your understanding that you are providing this information to us. Uh, you can go off the registry at any time if you don't want to be on it anymore, but it's a great tool for us to have to know who's out there and who has these cameras and saves us some time from doing a canvas in the area for video surveillance. So some information on when to call the police. Anytime there's a life and death emergency, obviously call 911. Anytime there's a crime in progress, 911. So the police should be involved whenever there's a situation that becomes volatile, escalates into violence, or threats against a person, or a victim fears for their safety or the safety of the general public. This could be through threats made in person, or it could be by phone or by email from someone, an accused party, and public safety warrants the police involvement. If it's something that isn't urgent or imminent, then you can call our non-emergency line. But if you're not sure, just call 911. You will not be penalized for calling 911 if you need police assistance. There is the non-emergency line there. Um, and we also have the Crime Stoppers program if you want to remain anonymous. So I'm gonna explain how that works briefly because I know a lot of people are aware of Crime Stoppers, but they're not quite sure how it actually works. So typically what would happen is let's say um, you see someone steal your neighbor's barbecue, but you know who that person is and you know they're not a nice person and they may cause harm to you or you're fearful of retaliation. You could call Crime Stoppers and you could put in information. Now they will take your full name, uh, address, all your information about the tip, but what they do is they generate it into a, a report that doesn't have any identifying information about yourself and only has basic information about the tip. That report then comes to the police. The police have to investigate it. They can't go based on the tip alone. So they will do a full investigation, uh, try and figure out if they can identify the suspect through other means, whether they find other witnesses, video surveillance in the area. And if they're able to identify and arrest the individual, they will then go back to Crime Stoppers, give them the outcome of what the investigation led to. And if it leads to an investigation, then Crime Stoppers will reach out to the tipster and they will be given payment for that tip. Now, I don't know how much payment and I don't know what kind of scale, but obviously if it's a more serious type crime, it could be a higher amount of payment. So although Crime Stoppers works with the police, they are independent to the police and we are very mindful of the anonymity. I can't say that word of making sure that they remain anonymous. So um, make sure you tell other people that uh, this program is out there if they're afraid to come forward and report. So Danielle Froud and I are the two senior safety officers in the unit that work along with Chantal. Uh, sadly, Danielle was pulled away for another event today, so she couldn't be here and she sends her regrets. But there's our contact information there if you have any questions. And if you want to send us an email, as long as it's not urgent, um, senior safety at yrp.ca. But goes to both Danielle and I and Chantal can have access to it too. And we can get back to you um, about your inquiries. Um, but then it allows us to have access to it if, say, maybe Danielle or I are away, um, then it's available to everybody in the unit. Any questions or anything I haven't answered or if people have anything they want to talk about? Nothing in the chat yet. Well, I want to thank Officer Aaron Brown and Chantal Bennett for sharing all of the wonderful information that the senior safety team has to offer. I know that I myself have learned a lot today and I actually am a wee bit afraid, I have to say, because some of these phone calls and scams are very convincing but at least I know not to be worried based on what you have shared. And I look forward to sharing all of this information with other individuals. This recording will be put up on our website for individuals to um, share with other people. 
Um, Chantel, was there a question that um, there just is came a question? Out? There's a question. Um, so for Aaron, if um, someone saw someone run through the red light, can they mm -hmm. contact Crime Stoppers? Mm -hmm. So, so you can, can contact, contact Crime, Crime Stoppers, Stoppers. Um, but we also have a driving complaint platform where you could submit a driving complaint online. So if you go onto our website and go to online reporting, if you click down through that, it will give you the option for um, different driving offenses. Now, what happens in this program is um, what we will review it, we'll look into the information, and a road watch letter could be sent out to that person. If it's something that's already happened and it wasn't actually witnessed or, or video captured, we can send out a road watch complaint letter to the owner of that vehicle, and it will just lay out, on this date, this vehicle was seen doing said offense, could be speeding, going through a red light, stop sign, what have you. And um, and then it will also say at this time, there will be any charges. We're letting you know, because a lot of times, sometimes it's not always the driver or sorry, the owner of the vehicle that's driving. Maybe it's a youth um, and, you know, it just lets them know because as the owner, they are responsible and liable for all actions in those vehicles. Thank you, Erin. Are there any other questions? There it is. Oh. Okay. Um, when you when you made a visa transaction, why often do you immediately get a text message like on your card that it's been frozen? How and why does this happen? This seems to be happening uh, quite often. So, so good question. question. Um, um, there's so much technology out there that the criminals have access to. And um, if you're using banking online, you're better to do the two-step verification to make sure that it's through a secure portal. Um, sometimes these scammers can um, not hack into your information, although they can do that sometimes, but they, they may be able to piggyback on certain transactions or have algorithms to know that this has happened. And then this way the computer can let them know and then they can send a message. So um, sadly, that's a little out of my scope as to how that actually happens, but um, there's a lot of uh, great amount of technology out there that does this. So just be mindful that if you're ever worried about something like that, or if you think that you've been compromised, you can always call the security department from the number on the back of your card or go into your bank to verify that information. And we just have another question that has come in and I'm just going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Sorry, just give me one quick moment to find you. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. You can unmute yourself now. Super, super, thank you kindly. I think more along um, the lines of that concern about the visa thing, I experienced uh, more than a couple of times whereby um, I had missed a delivery from a courier, including Canada Post, DHL, and um, FedEx. And then I got um, text messages um, about the um, the shipment. How do they know that they were going to be, you know, parcel arriving and what have you? Like, it's, I guess it's similar to what you had alluded to earlier, that they just have, um, they're able to tap into those um, databases? Yeah, and so, well, not so much the databases, it's more of the algorithms that might be on your cell phone if you're using your cell phone to check your emails and do various different things. Um, so I don't know if you're a Facebook user or anything, but I find once you use the different types of social media, if say you're searching up for something in your search function, then all of a sudden you're gonna start getting ads on your Facebook al algorithm that are similar to that. So there, there's features on your phone that they can put in or algorithms that are attached to various different applications that could alert them that, oh, you're receiving a delivery from this company or whatever keywords that may populate. So that's mm -hmm. probably why you're getting those follow-up messages. Oh. So they're not actually hacking into your accounts or your emails or that kind of thing, but it's keywords that are coming up. If you have that application open on your phone, then you open up your email, um, they, it, it will search the, that computer program or whatever it is that they have in there. The algorithm will search for those keywords. 
And then they can actually associate those keywords with my cell phone number, and then I get the those them automated. I guess they it's yeah. just generated. It's quite um astonishing. I was like, oh my gosh, how did they know that I had missed a delivery? Even yeah. though I didn't get for notification alert or anything to that effect. Yeah, it's pretty scary. I mean, and um, and something else for everyone to know as well that if you do get these uh, phishing type text messages or emails. If you reply to them or you answer phone calls from a scammer, typically those calls or text messages are generated by computers, like in call centers. You know, if you get a call from, say, the air duct cleaning companies, that's a good example where the call will come through, then you'll hear silence, then you'll hear a click, and then a noisy call center. So those are computers that are generating those calls, and they do it with uh, text messages and emails as well. So if you respond to those or reply in any way, the computer is going to pick up that this is a live person. They're going to respond to these. And then you're going to get more scam calls, more texts, and possibly more emails. So just be mindful of that. If you don't know who they are, don't even reply to them or don't say don't contact me because that's allowing the computer to get that data about you. I hope I answered your question okay. Well, once again, I encourage everybody to reach out to the senior safety team with any questions that you may have. And one of the big reasons why I really wanted to bring this phenomenal team to our community is so we eliminate the fear of reaching out and that they are here for us, for our community. So please, at any time, Use the contacts that are have been provided by both Chantel, as well as Officer Aaron Brown and uh, Officer Danielle Froud, who uh, is no, not able to be with us today. But on behalf of myself, on behalf of the Alzheimer's Society of York Region, I want to thank everybody for registering and joining the webinar today. And I truly want to thank Chantel and Officer Aaron for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom in our webinar today. Thank you for having us. Thank, yes, thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all, everybody, and we we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.